since the moment his wife returned from the town, Ned Murna knew she was going to say something to him. She had that extra slow way of going about the kitchen, extra gentleness in the way she set out the ware for their meal. She had brought home the local newspaper. He sat by the fire, turning the pages, scanning for a familiar name of a neighbour or town land. There's damn the devil of a bit of news in the chronicle, he growled. Not even the death of someone we know, adding hastily. Thanks be to God. She smiled at him. There was a quiet sweetness in the smile, almost an assurance, a confidence. Oh, there's something on her mind, all right, mused Ned. She's going to broach something. She's giving me the eye, like when we were curtain. There's always a time for caution, he warned himself, when a woman gives you the eye. Who did you meet in the town? Ned asked. She set the teapot on the table, adjusting the netted cosy around it. She smiled again, but Ned could see that this was a smile of ingratiation. She was aiming to give herself confidence this time. Oh, he knew he was right. He was a good judge. She was not given overly to those smiles. Not indeed, Ned hastened to assure himself that she was a soured woman. Oh, she was not, nor a mean-spirited woman. Nevertheless, the loving smiles were reserved for the daughters and the grandchildren on a Sunday. Ah, well, that was natural, Ned felt. That was the way it ought to be. When a couple got to their age, giving the eye was a thing of the past. Did ye not meet anyone so? he repeated. Beyond that, I saw some of the women from around here when I was gathering a few things in the supermarket. And were you talking to no one then? You were going long enough to be gossiping. She bowed her head, and he was a small bit sorry, for she never was a one for gossip. All the same, to be gone the whole morning and to come back silent as the grave was trying to a man's patience. All right, all right, then, he muttered. You went to town, you talked to nobody, and you saw nothing. Oh, but I did, she put in quickly. I did. I saw something. I saw something in Mulroney's shop. Now Ned was puzzled. His instinct was right in the beginning. She had something to say. But Mulroney's shop? And what would you see in Mulroney's shop? Two women in their right mind wouldn't be going in there. Old Mulroney's as mad as a coot, and his father before him ended up in the county home. So they're the next best thing to tinkers, them in their old junk shop. Did anyone see you get in there? I don't know if they did, she answered, visibly nerving herself to make a steady reply. I wasn't noticing if anyone saw me. I was only looking at at, at, at the thing in the, in, in, the, in the window. And what did you see in the window? Would you speak up, woman? What did you see in the window of Mulroney's shop? The woman's face flushed with embarrassment and effort. Uh, I, I saw the present you said you would give me, Ned. Ned looked at her in speechless mystification. A present? What present? I never said I would give you a present. Are you feeling all right? Ned gave her his full attention. He examined her face closely. Her white hair, her white apron her sensible shoes. She didn't look like a woman whose brain was a bit touched, but then he never could tell with this woman, so he changed his tone of voice to a kinder, less sarcastic note. Are you sure you're feeling all right? Yes, yes, I am, thank you kindly, he replied. There was a little pause. She took a deep breath. You remember when I told you that this week... We will be 40 years wedded together. And you said, oh, Begore, you said, we'll have to celebrate that. 40 years, is it, you said? And Ned remembered. He remembered thinking that 40 years was gone like a shout on the wind. And he remembered dismissing the thought of it from his mind. She was looking at him now, hopefully, affectionately. I asked you maybe if I could have a present from you for the memory of the 40 years. Do you not remember? Or what did I say? Well, you said, pick out something, you said, and let me know. So you picked out something in Mulroney's shop, thought Ned. And now you let me know. Oh, a man's instinct is a great thing. 
and let's a man beware when his pocket is going to be picked. Sharpen the wits now, and have a good excuse why money's scarce. What's this going to cost me? asked Ned, in a manner of a man accustomed to dealing in thousands. Well, tis this way, Ned, pleaded his wife. It, it's not a very great sum of money. It's, it's more like... Uh, well, would you give it for what it is? Well, what is it, woman? demanded Ned in a voice one note lower than thunder. He prided himself on being a patient man, but not in the face of provocation, not with people who hedge around mincing words. Out with it, can't he? He paid no heed that her lips were trembling. Well, it's... It's a... It's a, it's a Chinese chair, Ned. His face and his mind went blank. He was affronted. He couldn't take in her words. Something about the humble woman in front of him robbed him of his proper dignity. He looked at her. Framed in the kitchen window, the lamplight lent a sparkle to her white hair. There was a jar of snowdrops on the window seat, completing the still picture. She sat like that every evening, tidy and silent, patiently waiting for his return before she would switch on the television. Oh, she loved the company of the television, but she would always wait. <sighs> you can have the on you you were talking about. How much is it, anyway? Her face was radiant. It's five pounds, Ned, and if we take it, Mr Mulroney will give us the little table that goes with it for one pound more, and he said he will deliver it out to us for only fifty pence. Six pound and fifty pence for Mulroney's old rubbish, Ned swore inwardly. I'll give you the money Saturday. He settled himself into his chair. What's on the old box tonight? This inquiry informed her that conversation time was over. They never spoke in the bedroom any more than they would talk at a funeral. Ned was usually asleep before the woman had finished her night prayers. But tonight was different. Over the fingers linked into the rosary beads, she was beaming up at him. Ned, she began shakily. Thank you for the... Thank you, thank you. Ned, you should no practice with words unless you knew them by heart, like our prayers. Yet she was set on saying what was in her mind, and a gentle determination carried her forward. It was in a story we read in school. It was a story from the Golden Age. He was the king, I think, and he was giving the lady a present for every year. The present was called... A love gift. I've never forgotten that, Ned. A love gift. And then I seen the, in, in, in Mulroney's shop and, 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 and Miss Little. The last words were muffled as the woman pressed her face into the white quilt. A ah, load of nonsense, muttered Ned, drawing the blankets round his ears. On the Friday, Ned observed his wife was busy freshening up the small porch that formed the entrance to their house. It had never housed anything more than a few geraniums. Now, he guessed, the porch was to be the last resting place for Mulroney's six pound and fifty pence worth of rubbish. The little porch was ready and shining on Saturday when Mulroney came with his van of bits and pieces. These are genuine antiques, presumed Ned as he counted out six pounds and fifty pence for the two articles of black lacquer and red inlay. Mulroney gave him his ferdy grin. They are genuine Chinese. It would cost you more than that to go there and buy them. Which I suppose you did, said Ned, with a ton weight of sarcasm. In the kitchen, the woman dusted the two pieces carefully. Then, with immense tenderness... She polished them till they shone. Aren't they only beautiful, she breathed over and over. Ned didn't agree. He averred he was not gone on black lacquer. There was a row of tiny red dragons carved across the rounded back of the chair. Them boys would stick into you if you were to sit on it, Ned pointed out. But of course, it's, it's, it's only uh, ornamental. I mean, who in the right senses would sit on the thing? I would, his wife said softly. Oh, look, Ned, there's a little drawer in the table. Any money in it? 
There's a whinchy key. Look, it fits the little drawer. She turned the key, the lock clicked smartly. The drawer was firmly closed. With infinite pleasure, she placed and replaced the two pieces in the porch. At last, she seemed satisfied to stand and gaze in admiration. Sure, who'll see them anyway? Anyone coming in here comes into the kitchen. That dull stuff is only ornamental. You'll never get the use out of them. He knew the woman was unmoved by his jibes. Her quiet demeanour told of her contentment. She had had a dream, and her dream had come to pass. Someone, his father maybe, had told Ned that women are kettle cattle. Hmm. Ned was sure that was true. Now, after Mass on Sundays, the Blather Sullivans usually come up the lane to the house. No, they were never invited, but they always found a pretext. The usual one was an urgent loan, and occasionally to be forced with fresh news of a happening in the townland. This time, Ned surmised, they'd seen Mulrani's van passing up the lane on Saturday, and he doubted if they'd slept a wink with the curiosity. A spirit of boastful mischief came into Ned. He led the Sullivans around to the front porch. Throwing open the heavy door with a lordly gesture, he thus invited them to step inside. You've come to see our valuable antiques, have you, eh? Oh, look there. All the way from China, that. Oh, yes, didn't you know? Oh, herself was a great fancier of Chinese gigos. Oh, didn't you know? Cost me a bloody fortune. Oh, you have to pay for the genuine articles, you see. If you want the best, I always say, provided you recognize it, well, you have to dig down deep. He was slyly glancing from Tom Sullivan's big red gob to Mrs. Blather Sullivan's bulging cheeks when, out of the corner of his eye, he saw his wife standing at the kitchen door. She was looking and listening. All the bright serenity of her face was gone, covered over in a grey mist of age. Well, doesn't that be it all, thought Ned, bolstering himself with vexation at her. Instead of crying with mirth at the way the Sullivans were lapping it up, this one was probably crying with a broken heart because I was jeering her old Chinese rubbish. I, I was the one that let her have it, wasn't I? Women, he had read somewhere, had no sense of humour. But he got rid of the Sullivans, walking them up the lane, covering their blather with blather of his own. As Ned was heading home, from afar he saw the vehicles turning into the lane, but took in the Sunday visit of the daughters and their husbands and the grandchildren. <laughs> Safety in numbers was another good trick, when situations were a wee bit delicate. Later that evening, when the house was restored to quiet and the woman gone to prepare for bed, Ned made his customary way into the porch to lock up for the night. He was half expecting to find the Chinese furniture had been banished up the yard, her grounds for acrimony hidden from sight. But there was no change in the little room. His loud words of the morning had not left an echo to spoil the fragile peace. The red dragons were still puffing their way across the back of the chair. A small vase of budden twigs had been set on the Chinese table. He tried the front door, which he had so grandly flung open to the Sullivans. It didn't budge. The big key was missing from its lifelong place. He looked around. The drawer of the table was shut. The woman's winchy key removed for safekeeping. He juggled the Chinese table gently. Ah, he could hear the heavy porch key Sliding in the drawer. <laughs> he slackened his jaws into a knowing grin. <laughs>